Hey guys, I'm excited to share with you Ken Kronz. Uh, he is in one of my mastermind groups. This guy is elite, high level. He's doing lots and lots of subject to lease options and he's going to share some of his creative real estate with you. So without further ado, my friend and mastermind partner, Ken. We syndicated the down payment and just to kind of add a tiny bit of value to anybody in the room who would want to do syndications and to be on the um, active side of the syndications, I wanted to share one thing with you and that's what I learned when I was re raising this last uh, uh, million plus, this last seven figures and that was that you have to, it's your whole mindset. So the way you're thinking about when you're raising the money has to kind of change. So if you, if you feel like you need money for your deal, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to raise money for your deal. But if you understand what type of service that you're providing for somebody else, if you understand what the returns are that they can't get in the stock market or whatever, you have to really uh, understand that inside and out. That will help you a ton when you're raising money from investors. It's always what's in it for them. And so I hope that that makes a, a difference for anybody in the room who's raising money, whether it's you know seven figures for a large apartment building or whether you just have uh, a small fix and flip. You have to be able to say, hey, I've got the second position opportunity for you. It makes 12% or whatever. Would you be interested? It changes completely if I, I need money, I need money. Don't think about yourself, think about them, and that helps a ton. So uh, with that said, let's introduce uh, Ken Kronz. He is a subject to uh, investor. He's done all sorts of creative deals. His main focus is buy and hold. Usually he likes more bedrooms, and so his family is stay for a long time. So it's really interesting what he's doing, and I hope you learn a ton. Give him a round of applause, Ken. Let me see. Turn it up. <coughs> Let me see that part. Let me see that part. Mic check. All right, I'll give you that. Um, okay. I'll give you this one. Good, because uh, I kind of felt like Janet Jackson or Tony yeah. Robbins or something. Like that. Oh, you had it on. Yeah, test, test. test. You only flipped it one time. You have to flip it two. Oh, you got so you want to do Janet Jackson or do you want to hold that? Um, and that's part goes on your left. Switch it. Really? Yep. You got it. You didn't so take that good in my college training course? To... No, I don't have much of a college education. I can't get a job. All right, and then flip so the flip thing up. twice, not this once. Thing? Yeah. Go all the way. Don't go. Oh. Yeah, but you're not like flip it twice. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Miss Jackson. Okay, so uh, it's about subject two deals. Um, how to buy houses with built in financing. I'm glad I had a mic today. I did this on Tuesday. It was like a smaller place with no mic, and my voice was shot. Um, I do feel weird with this thing on. Okay, so here's the agenda. Um, we have to get right into it, especially since we're running a little bit late. Um, got some disclosures, who am I to be up here, clarification, what is it subject to, like, what does that mean, uh, why would you do it, how to fix and flip using the subject to process, and then how to buy and hold using subject to. Um, and then some documents, risks, Q&A, and then blah, blah. So here's the legal disclosure. Uh, this presentation and the speaker are not providing legal, financial, accounting, real estate, marriage, psychological, or any other professional advice. Okay? Uh, see proper advice from a competent professional or a psychiatrist. Uh, if you decide to use these techniques, good for you, but if you screw up, it's not my fault. There you go. So who am I? Um, I had a job and all that stuff, and the financial meltdown came. I got into real estate. I was like, yeah, that's the worst real estate market since the Great Depression. Let's go do that. Um, so I started uh, wholesaling back then, wholesaled for a few years, did a bunch of deals, uh, double dry closings and all this crazy stuff we used to do back then. Um, I couldn't get a job, so that's why I did it. So luckily, I couldn't get a job. Best thing ever. Um, then after a few years, I started doing my own fixing slips and instead of wholesaling, I was like, oh, let me try a couple of these and that worked out. Um, and then about five years ago, a friend of mine, Dimitri, gave me the Kool-Aid and I drank it. And so I started keeping them as rentals instead of 
paying off the tax on fixing things. And from a tax standpoint, that's been phenomenal, and cash flow as well. Um, so currently I do a few fix and flips a year, I'm just a one man show, I don't do a ton. Um, and then I'm trying to build build up a rental portfolio, so I'm trying to add four to six rentals a year as well. Um, and right now, today, right now, I'm a guru, as of this moment. And that, with that said, in the back, we're going to be selling tapes, $10,000 value. Today, only $19.99, big millions on subject two. Coming soon, the compact disc, also known as a CD. Um, but if you buy it today, it's only 1989, so, which is the same year this was manufactured. I'm just kidding. This is free, and you should thank Adam for uh, putting these things on. If they do this stuff for free, it's just awesome. Um, so if you have millions of dollars, lend it to him, and then hopefully instead of saying seven figures, soon he'll be saying eight. There you go. Right? <laughs> Uh, so what is a subject to deal? Does anybody know what that is off the, in their head? Does anybody not know what it is? Okay, we got one. Good, I'm glad you came. Uh, glad you came on the one. So subject to means you're buying a property with a title, basically. And you're always buying subject to, to be honest with you. You're always buying subject to taxes being paid or something like that. So what people normally mean when they subject, say subject to is there's usually a deed of trust for a loan, also known as a mortgage in other states. Um, on the property, and that's you're, you're leaving that in place. That's buying it subject to. You could also buy it subject to other liens and encumbrances in hopes of getting a deal, you know, getting those taken off at a really cheap price and creating value. But today, we're really going to concentrate on um, you buying a property without paying the seller's loan off. That's what we're talking about subject to today. So, why would you do a subject to deal? Well, there could be a few reasons. Um, you can get a deal with the financing already in place. I talked about Tuesday that some people bought a house in North Glen um, a few months ago or a year ago, and now um, they're falling behind and he's gonna take over the payments and they owe about what it's worth or maybe a little bit less, but it's not a phenomenal deal, but it's gonna pick it up without any cash, basically hardly any cash. Um, maybe less money out of your pocket, same thing. You're just picking it up and starting making payments, potentially. <clears throat> it's not on your credit. There's no credit needed because you're just making a deal with the seller. Um, you can also pay the seller a little bit more and beat the competition. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say you're going to get hard money and it's going to cost you, let's say, ten grand. Maybe offer the seller five grand more, but you leave the loan in place. You make it on both ends. Um, probably a good rate in return, or a rate in term, like they usually have a more thirty-year mortgage. If they've gotten a, a loan in the last ten or fifteen years, the rate's probably awesome, and the term's probably pretty good. Well, maybe not if they bought the twelve years. Ago. Um, and then you can avoid or reduce your hard money costs. So hard money, sorry, hard money, hard money people. You still need hard money. So. And why would the seller do a subject to deal? Like, why? It's stupid, right? So the main thing is to get out of their, the first thing is get out of the bad situation, whatever that may be, divorce, foreclosure, bankruptcy, whatever it is, there's always a situation, right? Um, or to avoid foreclosure. They put it down on their payments and they're like, listen, I don't want foreclosure on my credit. And you say, great, I'll come in and I'll take over the payments and I'll make up the back payments. You're good to go. And then that'll be reestablishing your credit as well. So you can take it over and reestablish the credit. But mostly it's because you asked. You said, hey, listen, when I buy a property, I usually just leave a loan in place. It's just easier for me. That helps me do the deal with you a little bit easier. Um, and a lot of times you'll just say, oh, we'll be that's pretty much it. Um, so how to apply a wholesale or uh, and fix and place? Um, so you can sort of wholesale. It's got to be the you know people that are professionals. You can't wholesale from like a homeowner or something like that. That's trouble. Um, but you, basically the way to do it is you buy it in the property subject to just you buy it and just leave the loan in place. You can fix it up or not depending if you do it a fix and flip or a, a wholesale. Then you sell it, and then the note gets paid off when you sell it. So the note that you left in place with them will get paid off. Um, and then you make a profit, just like any other deal. So here's an example of that. So this is like kind of a wholesale or a hotel or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's where you basically buy the property and then you just resell it. This one I have to put on MLS to sell it, um, but you could wholesale it to somebody or whatever. So basically on this one, it was on Tufts in Centennial. It was a $190,000 purchase price. Um, the loan they had in place already was $184,000. She was current on this loan. 
So I had basically 10 grand out of pocket with closing costs and everything to buy this property for a $200,000 property. So if an investor would put 5% down, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, so then I put it at the MLS, as is, you know, it was kind of a newer home, but it was in beat up shape, it was kind of livable, so you could like, put some over into it. Um, they bought it for 2374 The loan balance at that point after a payment or whatever was 183786 Had uh, almost eight grand in commissions and closing costs. So the profit, um, so that's what was invested. Um, oh, and then I had payments and utilities and things like that. So the total investment was uh, 13 dollars 13 6 The gross profit was $45,699 minus the total investment for a $32,105 profit in 47 days from close to close. So that kind of shows how you can take ten grand, do something with it, and then make it into a bunch more money. And how much more would that be? Well, if you figure it out, it's about 236%. That's pretty good. But what if you annualize it? What's the return? It's good enough. <laughs> good enough. Close enough. We can take a quick break. Mm -hmm. All right, so they're coming in in about less than a minute. So just have your order ready. Uh, we're recording it, so try to keep it quiet. Just give them the order. And then after we order the food, we will uh, just basically they'll bring out tickets pretty quick. Because uh, everybody's on their own bill, and after that, they'll bring out the food when it's ready, and we'll be paying, and everything will be smooth sailing. So have your order ready in less than a minute. Thank you. Hope you're hungry. All right. So here's a here's a full blown fix and flip example. So this is a Park Hill. Um, so this is a Kearney. This is a fix and flip with full rehab. So on this one, uh, we paid two hundred thousand dollars for it. And we, the seller netted nine thousand dollars. There's one hundred ninety-one thousand subject to a PAH mortgage, so we just left that in place. And this guy had an attorney and everything else, so you know, it's, they can have an attorney. You want to be full disclosure and everything. Um, so I had to ten six eighty seven out of pocket on a two hundred thousand dollars house. Again, five percent is not bad. Um, just thinking away. Oh, yeah. um, so why was it nine thousand to the seller? Well, where did we come up with that money? Or that number. You have to ask these people what they need. It's about making the deal, right? So he wanted three grand for each of his grandkids. That's it. So I said, great, let's do that. So that's what we did. Everything got adjusted to that nine grand. That was the, the set point. So and then we resold the property. We put a bunch of money into it. Made it really nice. Um, so the total investment on this uh, was ninety eight thousand um, dollars. Then we resold it for three sixty for a sixty thousand dollar profit. This took a few months. Um, so on this particular deal, instead of if we didn't do that, let's say we did hard money, it would have cost like twenty grand this thing with the points and fees and all that kind of stuff, or some, something like it. In the teens anyway. Um, so that's just another way to do a deal. And then here's a, an example on the settlement statement. I did want to show you. It's right on there. Loan payoff, PHH mortgage, one eighty six zero fifty nine. Mm -hmm. So, and on the buying settlement states, I took a bunch of those out because you couldn't really see them very well. So I don't know how to use PowerPoint. Um, basically, it says right on the, the HUD and the normal settlement statements, it says loan taken subject to. Like, it's a line on the HUD. So it's like totally legit to do this. No weirdness about it. Um, so what else could you have done on this deal? Okay, let's get creative. Let's say you don't want to do a fix and flip. You found the deal and you're like, ah, oh, I just want to make quick buy on this thing. You know, I heard about wholesale, it's really cool. I found this deal, what do I do? Okay, there's a couple things you could do. You could buy it subject to, you know, do the paperwork like you're buying it. Then wholesale it for 210 to me, of course. Um, <laughs> for, you can make a quick $10,000 profit. So you can just do that. You can make a quick 10 grand, right? Now, the other thing you could do is you could take. Twenty thousand dollars down from me or whoever it is, maybe. So you have your ten grand back that you put down. You have your ten grand profit in your pocket, as if you wholesale it. And if you did, then you can loan that hundred ninety thousand dollars to the buyer, me or whatever other investor, for a few months. But you could do it at hard money rates. So the loan you took subject to is five percent or four percent or whatever it is, maybe. And then you sub to this thing, you, you say, hey, listen, I'll give you a little for 190 grand. It'll be two points and 15% of whatever hard money is these days. And then you could make another 10 grand, 15 grand on the spread. 
you can be the lender. They don't want to do this consumers, and just professionals. You can't lend to consumers. Um, it's just another way to make arbitrage. It's another way to think creatively to just make it more spread, make more money. And it's good for everybody. Like, that's just a super easy deal, by the way. Don't worry. I'm getting into the where hard money is good. <laughs> I'll fight you hard money. <laughs> no, you need hard money. Hard money is good. Um, so here's a little house in my house. This is just a real quick one, but I um, did this a couple of years ago. I got a call from a lady in Park Hill from a postcard I sent, and she said, hey, um, you know, I live in Park Hill, but do you have any houses in Montrose? And I said, oh, yeah, what the hell is Montrose? And I can look it up. I had no clue where Montrose was. Um, so the bottom line is that I flew out there, and I looked, I made the deal, and then I flew out and looked at it one time. And um, bought it for 65 grand. It was pretty beat up. Um, but she had a sub two with Bank of America for 57 grand. So it was 8,300 bucks out of pocket. Not as good percentage wise as the other deals, but it's all right. It works. I didn't have to come up with much. Then I had all these options. I could wholesale it, I could rent it. And she had a really good mortgage on there, like 12 years left. Right? So I could have totally rented the place. Um, but it didn't need work. I have only one home house in Montrose for very long. Um, so basically, we fixed it all up. Put a heating system in a kitchen on the field. Um, so we sold it for one sixty two five. Fifty three thousand was a payoff at that point. So, so we spent sixty nine five on everything, payments, resale costs, rehab, etc. For a forty grand profit. I ran a lot of that money came out of our pocket, and you could use a hard money for that, hard money lender for that money, right? Um, but you can make a profit. It's just another way to make a deal. That's kind of a simple one. Um, I want to give you a creative um, I haven't been creative to this point. So, uh, how about a subject to deal with an owner carry in second position and then a three month rent of one deal? Can you do that? Yeah, you can do it. Um, so, check this out. So, this is last year. So, I bought this property for $471,000. That's a wholesale deal in bulk. That's like a tent, right? Oh, shit. Yeah, it's a tough shit. Right? <laughs> so, um, took a first 350 grand subject to, and he had some back payments I had to make up. So, um, we did a $78,000 owner carry of 0% interest, zero payments for a year. $5,000 held back from him for his rent, because he's going to live every two months. Um, three grand property tax credit. So, total of 35 grand out of pocket to buy a $470,000 house. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's good. Percentage, eight percent, something. Um, not bad. Fixed it all up, did the whole thing. Uh, sold it for six forty-five. Had one hundred twenty-nine grand all in expenses, rehab, interest, commission, the whole thing for a forty-five grand profit. So that shows you know one way you could be creative to make a deal to do a flip. Would I do that again? Probably not. It's just way too much money, way too much risk for forty grand. Mm -hmm. I did two of those deals like in the upper. Like over 500 grand last year, and I just don't understand those buyers. They think they're buying a million dollar house, they're buying half a million dollar house. And just, I'm like a ghetto. I just want to fix up crappy and stick with the ghetto. <coughs> so here's a settlement statement one of them. Um, so right there it says, I think this is the buyer one. Yeah, 4470 purchase. So seller financing 78 grand, earnest money held, rent. Loan taken subject to, this is right on the settlement statement. So this is, it's completely legit to do this. Some title companies won't do it, but um, First Alliance title will, I think title one. Some of the more liberal title companies. I use First Alliance title like a ton of stuff. They do a class on how to do this like from a title company perspective. So um, they're really good about it. So that just kind of shows you how it breaks down there. Oh, here's the resale. So 645 on resale. 342, 948, subject to SWBC mortgage, which is a older company. Um, yeah, just push right there and you can do it. This is a year ago. This is where it gets really interesting when you apply it to prices. And it gets people think long term, you know, like short term, it's easy because you don't have to worry about do on sale clause, you don't have to worry about a lot of stuff. People are like, oh, what about this? What about that? Short term, who cares? They call me and say, we need the money right now. You say, great. Call me in a couple months and I'm going to sell. doesn't matter. Uh, rental, you're going to have it for a long time. Right? That's the whole goal. So, same thing, you buy it subject to, just like normal, you buy it, you leave the mortgage in place, you rent it out, and then you collect the spread. Just like any rental. 
So this one's on 91st in Thornton. Um, so this one uh, we bought for the current note amount, and we paid all the back payments. It was nine months behind, or whatever, whatever it was. Um, so basically, it settles the table. He got zero dollars and zero cents. He just wanted this thing gone, and out of his name, and out of his life, and he wanted to fly to Malaysia to be with his girlfriend, or whatever, something like that. So like, he literally threw out the next week to, like, with Hans or something. Um, so it was 144000 dollars sale price. This house was, it had a problem, and needed a sewer line, and had some water in the basement and stuff. Um, not super bad, but bad enough that it needed work. So it was 13 grand out of pocket to buy it. And again, it was more of a rehab. I don't have that on here, but. Um, so the note was 131. PITI was 935 a month, now it's 956. 4.375% for a 30-year fixed VA. Some of you might be like, I can't get three and a half, you know, whatever. But for an investor walking and saying, hey, leave me alone, I'm getting five and a quarter right now. So this is good. To me, this is good. And I don't have to pay any points, I don't have to pay any fees, I don't have to pay any appraisal, none of the bank asking me for 6,000 pieces of paper. Um, and I don't think I call I'm an employee, so. Um, <laughs> so that's a 30-year fixed loan. Um, fixed it up and rented it for eighteen ninety five. Now it's like nineteen fifty or whatever. Um, it's got no garage or anything. Um, but I mean, you just, I mean, that's that's a good spread, right? It's a thousand bucks a month, and I did have to put money into it, so the return's not as good as it looks on here. But you know, I was willing to do that. So and here's a settlement statement: one hundred forty four grand. Financial consideration debt. Uh, Contract 144, prorations adjustments 144, so it's the same same price. And then I came up with the money for the back payments out of the closing. So it's 12 grand after 13 grand. I was trying to mess with this last night, trying to figure out how to do this spreadsheet stuff, but I don't get it. Um, so here's a current example. This is kind of, you can't see it, but so May 1st of this year, here's a current statement. So it's got my name on it. It's got my name on it, it's got uh, the address, and this is just, just sitting there making money. Here's a house on Lincoln. Um, this would be the tower, but um, so I sent the postcard, and then Paul gave me a call, and he said, You know, I'm really sick of walking the village in to take a dump. <laughs> that was his words, not mine. He had to take a dump, he had to go to walk all the way down the village, village in. To take your crab and probably had to like buy food or while I was there. <coughs> Knew everybody there. So yeah, that sewer line for years didn't do anything. And this is a funny side story. When we replaced the sewer line, we dug up all the you know the old sewer line, they put it in a big pile, and then they put it back. So I don't know where that seed came from, but just uh, you know, you figure it out for yourself. Um, so I bought this property and it was, you know, like I said, you a lot of work, right? Um, paid 75 grand for it, took a loan 60 grand subject to, it was currently a green shirt or something like that. Um, had to put a sewer line in it and rehab it. But it's a 4.5% loan. PITI is 519.34. I don't know what it is today, but maybe that's what it is today. Around there. Um, but that's PITI, that's taxes, insurance, the whole thing. 520 bucks. Can anybody make money on it? Right? You can make money on it. And again, if you're the type of person that just doesn't want to jack with this, 75 grand, I guarantee you half the people in this room would say, yeah, I'll give you 85 for it, or 100, or whatever. Even if he does need all that work. So that one just kind of sits there. It's now Ditec, it got transferred to Ditec or whatever. Um, so there's a current, this is a, as of uh, April of this year. So there's a, there's a four and a half percent right there. Let's get the turn on here. Payments. Oh, 568. So it's making 568 now because taxes have gone up. Now, oh, and here's the settlement statement. Loan taken subject to, right on the settlement statement. I mean, it's completely legit. And now, this guy had this dream that he was going to sell his house, buy an RV, and move to, drive to Maine for all the hot women and the hot lobster. <laughs> or some kind of crazy thing. So, I was trying to help him out. So we found this on Craigslist. And now he's living the dream in his RV. <laughs> he like literally drove it out front, moved the stuff into the RV, and drove away. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. yeah. So use money from the house to buy the Airbnb. Use what you want to get what you need to get what you want from the um, Here's one I did a while ago. It's about, well, not quite five years ago, but uh, so it's kind of a little bit dated as far as the time, but it's a really good example. Um, so this one's on Julian. It's a crappy house, slammed all the way against the alley. I mean, literally, the alley and the house are. You drive by, you put your mirror in. It's that close. Terrible location on the lot. Um, but it's a rental. It's good wholesale. It's what we wanted it. I'm still getting charged cards from Jason Byrne, you know, the home trust guys. They're like, I'm going to buy your house. I'm like, dude, I tried to sell them to you five years to see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I paid the guy a hundred grand. He was in Nevada. It was his brother's house. He died. It was 80 grand. Oh, he just knew he was getting 20 grand. Um, so I gave him 20 grand. Uh, there were 78 grand loans taken subject to, and this was the beauty of this. So there was 43 grand on first with Sydney Mortgage, 4.875%. And when I figured out the amortization scale, there was still like 37 and a half years ago. They had already had it mod modified or whatever. I think I still 33 years or something crazy. Huh? Um, so the payment was 395 PITI out the door. Like it was all TI, basically. But, um, <laughs> So now it's 418. This is a real cool part of this deal. There's 36 grand. The second is 36 grand. I'm in the Denver Urban Renewal Authority. So they've gone put in windows and a furnace and some electrical and a bunch of stuff like on a low income loan thing. Um, so it just sits there. There's no payments, there's no interest. I have no clue what it's due. I think it's like 20 years or something crazy. I have no idea. Someday I'll get a letter. So now I'm getting nothing. Um, so can you make money in this deal? Anybody It's still a good deal, I think. I don't know about that, but on some of those, they actually forgive that debt. Right. They, they, might, they might forgive it. Right. Hopefully somebody forgives it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll forgive it. So we'll see what happens. I'll let you know, I'll let you know in 15 years or something. But by then, I'll, you know, the, the last we're going to that now. So there it is, 100 grand. Existing loan taken subject to... Yeah, again, it's right on the side of the side. And that's a HUD. Yeah, see, that's an old HUD. So that was, that's a government form. So, totally legit. Here's the deal, um, the letter from Denver Urban Renewal. Because when I bought it, I was like, well, I got to know what's going on with this thing. Because I had no clue what it was. So here's the net payoff amount. 35 right? This is a deferred loan. No, no monthly payments are required. There is no per diem. The figure is good until... Indefinitely. Can you bring out a spell in here? Yeah. 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 So, they don't have a spell. I probably don't know how to look good for a bad one. Should be paid? Yeah. Um, so, moving on to insurance. So those are a few examples of what you can do on the flip and on rental to a subject to. Um, everybody says, hey, what about insurance? You know, the loan's still in their name, this and that and everything. Some people. I don't know if anybody does this anymore, but some people will get an insurance form that says, hey, you need to add me to your insurance, right? To not raise any funds. I don't like that, I don't do that. I get my own insurance. If something happens to this thing, I want to bring me a check, not me and some guy. Some guy and a new secondary, if it's the worst case scenario. So I get my own insurance, um, and I haven't had that issue, you know, they'll write you a letter like this that says, I did recently receive, recently received evidence of the insurance coverage currently enforced on your property. The evidence does not meet our requirements because the insurance name is not listed on the policy. But then it goes on to say, we are supposed to pay this no matter what government law. Therefore, we'll pay the premium on the evidence of insurance coverage from the escrow, even though the insurance name is on the policy, is not the same as on the account. So this is them saying, listen, we're required to send this check. Even though the insurance is in that person's name, the house is insured, we're going to pay it, but we just kind of have to send the notice. But we're still going to pay it. I haven't had any issues in five years, so so far so good. Can't be a definitive answer on that. I'm not insurance agent, but I've been able to get around it so far. Everybody I know, I've got a few stuff too. You get insurance in your own name? Yeah. Yeah, just get in your own name. Add it on there. Make sure they're lost. Hey, yeah, yeah. Does the seller still have his 
does the seller, the question is, does the seller still have their insurance? Um, I would say no. I mean, they could leave it on there, definitely do it, so you do your replace. So, no, they just need to cancel it. They should double insure it, they shouldn't be entitled to anything else. That's something happens to a property. You know. So, I mean, you're buying the property, you own the property once the deal goes down. Just because there's still a lien on it with their name, you know, attached to their credit, you still own the property. Um, and then the other thing too, the other question I always get, or that always comes up, not that I always get, I don't get this three times, it's my third time to do this. Um, the other question that always comes up is, what about the due on sale clause? So due on sale clauses, there's like 6,000 things in a note that they can say, oh, you're not doing this, we're going to take your house back. Right? The biggest one is, or one of the biggest ones, the biggest one's not paying them, of course, um, but one of the biggest ones is, um, if you transfer the title, so the title goes from the seller to you, that's a, that's a transfer. So it's called a due-on transfer clause. So if you do that, like the lender has the right to say, the title's been transferred, we want the money now. They have that right. Does it come up? I've heard maybe on Chapa deals it might come up. Um, but in my experience, I have not once encountered it, but then goes Chase, Wells, Ditech, um, city, you know, I got a bunch of these things. Um, and this is kind of the proof in it. This is one recently, or a year ago about. That tech has um, sold the rights to service your account to new residential mortgage. Who's new residential mortgage? Some investor somewhere. Somebody knows, right? That tech will continue to perform in the service. So they sold the wall, but they're still servicing. These things are so far down in tranches and CDOs and they're just lost in the abyss. They're just, they're just out there. And if it's being paid, and it's got a little positive check mark, like, yeah, it's my like, they're not going to jack up this loan, why would they? This is a positive check mark in that portfolio of loans. I mean, I just don't see it happen. I don't see it messing with it. That's something. Do you still have the ability to perfect your, your legal instrument in, this, in view of the acceleration clause? In other words, can you file? your promissory note so that you have it on the record that there's a legal transaction in existence between you and the seller. Um, I'm not really sure what the question is because the deed is already transferred. I own the property. Oh, I think the deed remains in the seller's name. No, absolutely not. Now, when you do these deals, you own the property. The deed's going to you. It's just got that title flaw that there's a lien on the property. And the bank still tolerate that? So far. Okay. So far, so good. Yeah. Cool. yeah. You just to make it clear, you do own the property. So you go to closing, you do the whole thing. If it's in your name now, or your company name, or John, you know, Joe Blow, Family Charles, whichever one you guys want to do it. Uh, but you own the property. You have full control of the property. It's just like any other lien that might just be signed. It's just like if you took and bought the property and got a loan for yourself, and then now it's on there. It's just you didn't do that. You just left the one that was already on there in place. You do own the property. All right. So I just wanted to show you, like, uh, for example, like a Nation Star with a GMAC key lock behind it. I refinanced out of that one. Um, Chase, I've got Chase currently. Um, this is all nice in theory, but how do you really do it? Well, you make the deal with the seller just like you normally would. You find a deal, you make a deal. So, first and foremost, this isn't a way to make a bad deal. You shouldn't go, oh, I can take it subject to, let me pay too much. Don't do that. Make a good deal first. That's the number one thing. Make a good deal first. And then use this as a tool in that deal. Um, let them know that they're going to net the same clothing. So, if you're paying 200 grand and they owe 150, and they're going to get 50 if you pay cash, they're still going to get 50 if you take it subject to. I mean, the, the payoff is still the payoff. You're still taking subject to bad amount on that day. Um, and then you do the documentation, normal documentation, uh, with a couple extra things, I'll go back in a second. And then you close at a title company if you want to be legit um, and make sure everything's on the up and up and done the right way. Or like my friend Fred used to do years ago, you can be a cowboy and so sign a deal. And then there's still guys that do that in this market. I know one guy that stole a deal from me recently. Uh, he wrote a couple checks and he'd get them back anytime soon. Because he did it on a guy in foreclosure and it got canceled in three days. And I don't know what's going to happen, but it's a really interesting saga to watch. So, all I know is these people now have a house that they're current. 
They ain't movies. Yeah. So do it the right way. Um, and then Clue, uh, yeah, Clue the title company. Documents. So here's what I'm talking about with documents. So normal documentation, what I do is I put the additional provisions. So I use the normal, I'm technically licensed, so I use the real estate, Colorado real estate stuff. Um, buyer will take the property subject to existing financing though with Wells Fargo or whoever it is. Um, and then you do a few extra pieces of paperwork. An authoriza- authorization to release information to you and the title. Now the title company always gets this anyway, so you might as well just get an actual for yourself. That gives them permission to call the lender and say, hey, what's the hell? Um, lender notification. So I used to have a thing that says, hey, we're going to be managing this property now, or some, something along those lines. And it's like, hey, listen, you need to send statements here now. You need to just, you know, um, call this phone number now. We want to, I don't think I say it in there, but we, I get online access to the account as well as possible. Um, and then a letter of agreement, which is basically a sub-two disclosure. It's a page saying, hey, this is a full disclosure. This thing's still in your name, still on your credit. We're not paying it off. Uh, and then insurance form, maybe that's, like I said, some people might want to keep other people's insurance, but I highly recommend them against that. Um, and then a power of attorney is probably the most important thing. So you want that so that you get an escrow check back. Let's say you're doing a flip. Three months later, you pay it off, and then an escrow come, check comes in the mailbox to you, and it's still in that person's name. Well, there's a check in their name, but they're probably going to sign it to you. And you know that was a deal, and they go, no, you made a lot of money. Maybe you that to me, said. Or whatever. Any other situation. But mainly, you want to be able to go to the power attorney and check and say, okay, I have the right to sign this thing. I have the right to get this money. Risks. All right, do you want cell phones? I kind of talked about that. It is a risk. It does exist. It's out there. Um, I don't worry about it for the reasons I've already mentioned. Nobody's paying attention, basically. They call the bank, they don't even know. If you have a calendar, they don't even pay attention. Um, insurance, we talked about. Check cashing, escrows, again, get that power of attorney so you can check cash those. Um, or anything else that might come out of the house if you need a power of attorney for anything. Um, and then there's risk with the note itself. So when you're buying these, you got to look at the statement at least, preferably the note if they can find it, which is rare. Right? Um, at least look at the statement. You know, it says 30 year fix, VA, whatever, here's the rate. You're pretty good. But there's notes out there that have adjustments, there's notes that are balloons, things like that. So whatever note you're getting into, just know what you're getting into. It might still be worth it to take it subject to, especially if it's a flip. But if it's long term, you might say, well, okay, I'll leave this in place for a year and then I'll use an appraisal in a year or six months to refinance. Um, and then selling, you know, getting a payoff, you need that authorization and possibly the power of attorney when you're, when you're done with that. It's weird because it's hard to get a payoff from the bank, right? If you're not the person. But if you stop making payments, like they'll just take money from anybody, right? They don't care at that point. So if you can't get a payoff, stop making payments. Um, that's not advice. Yes, you have a question? I didn't hear you talk about the IRS. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, so reporting to the IRS. Um, so when the 1098 comes in the mail, interesting, it's going to have that person's name on it. It's going to be attached to the national security, right? But you pay the interest, you have the right to write it off. You're the one paying it. So you just instruct them, like, hey, they won't get it, so they probably won't pay attention anyway, but you let them know that you're going to get that. Again, yeah, you don't even let it. You just, you just take it. So what I do on my taxes, I, it comes as under other interest. So it's just we line item it as other interest, and then we put that in there. Um, the 1098 for the IRS. And so far, it hasn't been any kind of issue because you're legitimately paying it, and you have the right to write that off. So, so is it worth? It? Well, it's up to each, each and every one of you whether it's worth it. Every deal is different, obviously. Any deal is different. Um, but I think so. I like doing them. I'm supposed to be doing one, one day, Monday, but there's no way it's going to close Monday because she's not responding. Um, but I am doing one right now. I'm in the process of trying to do one right now. I have to pay 260 for it. I think she owes 200. So I'll come up with 60. And it's going to be a flip. So I'll just use that money for a few months and pay it off. How are you coming up with the 60? HELOC. We've got some HELOC set up. 
Uh, hard money would be a great idea. I don't think it will run in the second position, but probably not. Some might, some might not. Um, uh, but yeah, get some financial friends. Go ahead and deal with somebody. There's only a way. It's a good deal to find the money. Uh, right, Adam? Oh, yeah. It's a great deal to find the money. Especially with some good advice from friends at breakfast. <laughs> um, so there's you know, there's tons of notes out there with low fixed rates. Like I said, anything in the last, especially the last 10 years, but really the last 15, 20 years, other than that period where it was just madness. Um, there's phenomenal notes out there with 3%, 4%, 5%, like 30 year fixed. These are great to take over. If you can get a good deal on the house, like, just leave it up. Um, so they're excellent targets. Um, and this is kind of a weird forward thinking, out of the box kind of thing, but as rates go up, if you've got a low fixed rate, that rate becomes more valuable. Why is that? Well, maybe if rents are going up or whatever, the normal stuff. But the other thing is, what if you sold that house now and you over carried it? Well, now all of a sudden you've got 200 grand sitting there and you've got a 4.375%, and let's say rates have gone up a bunch, and now it's at 11%, you can make 6% spread or something like that. You can make more money on the way. Like I said in that previous example with the hard money. I uh, hope you learned something. Um, like any other thing, unless you learn any other thing you learn, it means nothing unless you take action. So we'll find a deal. Um, and the wealth process begins with our thoughts. It's very just. And thank you. Any questions? Question. I thought on subject to the seller campaign No, seller does not keep paying payments. And you can talk them into it, go for it. So far, for those of us who are brand new, do you recommend hiring a loan? That's your comfort level, but if that's what you feel like you need to do, then do it. Definitely use the title company, for sure, as well. Yeah, you want to make sure you're within the laws, especially if they're laid on the payments, then you've got to go to the Color of Closure Protection Act. And make sure you're doing things yeah, correctly there. So they're paying you and you're no, 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 no. You, you now own the property. You can do whatever you want with that property. They're off in law. Okay. They're gone. So you can rent the property and make money. So the other uh, thing that I speak about, I want to speak about, I haven't done much of it, but is speak to old folks that are now selling their properties, or empty nesters, or just moving to a retirement home, or whatever, but a lot of these people own houses pretty clear. And the example I'll give you is uh, three years ago, I bought a house from a guy in uh, University Hills. I paid the guy 240. Um, little, you know, back one of those little crappy houses down there surrounded by the mansions. And um, so the day before the closing, I said, hey man, what are you gonna do with the money? Put it in the bank, you got 1%. And they looked at each other and they're like, well, maybe two. We might get 2%. Right? I'm like, well, I've got to pay first bank three and a half. This is back when rates were a little bit lower. Um, i got to pay them three and a half, so why don't I just give that to you? And they're like, okay, that sounds good. It's like day before, like 24 hours before closing. So I went home and wrote a note. And so now, instead of that, those people put that in the bank and getting 1%, on 240 grams, just simple math, it's 2400 bucks a year. I pay him three and a half percent, and he gets like, 8,300 bucks a year instead. And I'm just thinking of all these folks out there that, you know, they got a house in the mountains, they got another house down here, they don't need the money. Like, if you need the money, you gotta take the money. Take the money and run. But, or, can't away, what are you gonna do? <laughs> um, but if you don't need the money, if you got a million dollars in the stock market and three clear houses and a place in bail, like, what are you gonna do with that money? Leave it there. Let it ride. Make the people put 20% down, maybe, or whatever, you know, depending on the situation. But. The first thing I did is I went in, I turned it into a four bedroom, two bath, instead of a three, one and a half. Redid the kitchen, made it super nice. You know, so all, automatically I increased this guy's position to where he feels really good. <coughs> right, and now here we have three, like, three years later, he's still letting it ride, he's getting his money, I, I pay him quarterly. Uh, it's been the best thing ever. So I'd love to get in front of a group of older folks that maybe are near that transition point to say, listen, here's just another option for it. You don't need the money. A lot of these people just see it like crazy. They have tons of money. They don't need the money. So just let it go. Let it you know? So that's the other thing. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know your bank statement. So you're using the property or whatever to 
notify the lender who sent it care of you? How are you getting your name on the bank statement? Yeah, so how am I getting my name on the bank statement? Um, so I take, sometimes they usually want power of attorney. So I have to send them a statement, you know, get a statement from the people. Send the power of attorney along with a letter that says, hey, we're going to be, I forgot how I worded it, but I think it's we're going to be managing this property now or something along those lines, or it's not completely laden, but I just bought it. Um, but here's the name that's got to go to, here's the address, and sometimes it takes a little bit of wrangling, but for the most part, they're just like, okay, whatever. Or if you can get online access, which I often do, you can go right in there and sometimes do stuff right in there, you know, change of address online. So I tried to get an online account, the Wells Fargo I couldn't get because the guy had a bank account there too. And I was like, well, you know, I don't, you don't have any other bank, but I don't. I don't want any drama with that. But I've got the Chase login, I've got the Well, uh, I took logins, uh, not the Wells, I've got a couple, couple of things. So that's how you do it though. Any other questions? Yeah. On a fix and flip is kind of one thing that you have, you're just making the payments for a few months. Right. Do you get, and how do you deal with seller pushback, say, if you're trying to do like a holding it for a rental? Because the loan's still in their name for so long, right? The loan's still in their name until we pay it off. Yep. I mean, they're, they're okay with like five or ten years. Or yeah, the ones I've done, they haven't brought it up. And I get this question as well. Like, people say, well, what if you make sure you pay it off in a certain period of time? You can make that kind of deal. You can put that in writing. I haven't had to just because either they're behind their payments and they're fleeing the country for either Maine or Italy or Malaysia or something like that, or um, they're dead. Like, I do a lot of public things. So sometimes these people are just dead. The in laws are like, okay, whatever. And then, as long as we can close the estate and we get our money, and we don't really care. So, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, I've got a few that are people that are deceased. Uh, uh, it's just a case by case. Yeah. How do you get the sellers to trust you that you'll make the payments? Or is it just since you're putting money down for them, giving them like a lump of cash typically? Right. Does the question that build the confidence? How do I get the sellers to trust that I'm going to make the payments? Well, if they're not making the payments already, obviously you come in, you buy the house, you make up the back, and they don't care about making the payments anyway. Um, the people that do care, um, it's really just to build rapport, you give them testimonials, give somebody a call that say, you say, hey, listen, this guy's paid me perfect. You're not um, showing like a credit report? No, I don't show a credit report. No. You, you, no. Can, you can um, yeah. use a servicing company, so you pay the servicing company, they pay the loan, yeah. and then the servicing yeah. company sends the seller. You could use the pay. servicing company if you wanted to. Um, but okay. I, it hasn't come up with me, it's just like a trust thing. And yeah, you're putting some money down, you're putting some skin in the game half the time, so. Yeah. You can trust this guy. Where you go with this? Yeah, I mean, you can put it right. I agree to make the payments, and you're not all deep within that. I mean, it's, that's the beauty of real estate. You can do anything. You can trade a car. I mean, you can put anything. Yeah. So I guess the person asked about if you're paying off some days or whatever. But are you doing something to agreement or wrap for a no, I just need something to ask and anything in there about how long it's going to be or anything like that. If, if it came up and somebody was concerned, I would. Like, yeah, it just hasn't come up. Yeah, the title company doesn't care. You would have seen it. Maybe they would do it. First clients would do it for a little charge. I don't know if the title company will do it or not, but their job is not to do contracts. That's kind of your job. If you have an attorney do it or maybe an agent or something, so you, you just write something out. You did do some sort of contract to get you to close. Yeah, you do a normal contract to get you. To put it under contract, you use a normal, whatever you normally use, uh, whether that be the Colorado ones or your own one pager that you got from a buddy. Or, I've done both ways. So, yeah. You just want to put that language in there and take subject too. Yeah, normal contract. You do normal, everything else is pretty much normal. Yeah. On your, uh, your closing um, uh, slide, you had notify the lender. I, will. I, I think you had. I think you had notify the lender. The, the, no, it's off that. Sorry. After? After, I think. Keep going back in other words? Or? No, 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 keep going forward. Um, 
blended notification. Yeah, so basically the blended notification is basically a, it's just a kind of a boilerplate form that I got from somebody else. I don't know, it's in the email chain. That just says, you know, we will be taking over this property, we'll be managing it, oh, okay. something along those lines. So we and you send that to them and say, okay, we're sending a statement here, here's a contact now. And you don't you know, have that say we're doing something too. No, you just you try to tell the lender as little as possible. Okay. Yeah. You don't want to create any <laughs> red flags. You don't, you don't want to tell them that, then we'll go to the next If it's a flip, you're like, screw you. We did. What would you do if you got hit with a do on sale? What would be your process to remediate that? Um, if I got hit with a do on sale, what would be my process to remediate that? Well, it was on a fix and flip, it's a pretty short time, right? So I wouldn't be real concerned with it because to exercise a do on sale, they literally, it's a foreclosure. I have to foreclose on it. Um, so that takes a few months. But by then, hopefully, you're out of it. Or you just call them. My first thing would be to call them and say, hey, listen, yeah. here's what we're doing. We're going to pay it off. Yeah. Right. They'd probably be like, ooh, 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 ooh. You know, they probably like, a bunch of idiots. But um, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. There are a bunch of people that are trying to work at their job very hard. And when they're told, check off. Um, and then on a, a long term hold, what I would do is. I'd probably just work on refinancing it or selling it or something like that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I got one. Oh, he's full. I'm full of something. So, what's the secret of finding these easily? My secret part? Yeah. A couple of items. Um, well, a a few, I'll tell you, a few of them were probates, you know, I used to do probate mailers, and I'll probably start doing those again, I was trying to be cheap and doing it cheap way, and I'm just too lazy to do that. Um, so, probates, um, one was a referral, uh, I do some postcards, big yellow postcards, say on my houses, you drop those on the neighborhood, uh, I got a couple that way, and one that way, um, so just normal marketing methods, for the most part, but something's listed, there's nothing wrong with you know, if somebody's listed on MLS, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, can we just leave this in place? You know, if they're a Dutch that's seller, they've got an as is property to beat up, they might say, sure, I don't care. Let's get this thing off my hands, and maybe I'll come to left. Any other questions? You, 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 you. What, what do you do when they want all of the equity out of the property? What do I do when, I want, when they want all of the equity of the property? Yes, they say it's worth three hundred thousand today, and the bond is one hundred and fifty, and they want they want that one hundred and fifty of equity. So what do you do if you're paying three hundred? That's yeah, that's the deal, right? Yeah. So if you're paying three hundred and they only owe one fifty, you gotta go with one fifty, or you can do a second or something like that. But if they want the cash, you could say, hey, I'll give, give me a number second for one fifty. It's a short term deal. I'll give you a little extra, give you some interest, something like that. But they just want the cash. They want the cash. Either he loves friends or um, something like that. You're going to friends with money. That's right. That's right. money. I'll give you a call. <laughs> Syndication. <laughs> right. Syndication, something like that. Or, yeah, pretty much you can be the spread somehow. Either creatively or cash wise. Anything else? All right. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah.